All right, so we're just going to start right off in Colossians chapter 2, verse number, we'll start at 14, and we'll read the rest of the chapter, and then we'll just talk about some things. Last week, I think it, I think it was last week, I asked you guys to think about how Jesus Christ is a shadow of these four areas, and we'll, we'll park it there for a minute, but let's read. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship, in humility, in neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So we spoke for a couple weeks on the whole aspect of the circumcision that we were uh, received of Jesus Christ, the burial uh, with baptism into death and to raise to walk in the newness of life aspect in verses 11 and 12, and then how he raised us. In verse 14, we parked it, finished up last week, on him blotting out our transgressions, forgiving us of everything that we've ever done. And the word blotting out, if you remember, if, if we talked about it, if you were writing on ink and everything, you can't erase that ink. So what, what they would do is they would sort of make a splat mark on it. So much as that you can't read what was previously written before. And so this is saying that all the sins that we've ever committed, when we came to Christ, when we got saved, when we received that eternal life, Jesus Christ blotted out all the trespasses that we ever did. That he just took it out of the way, as far as the east is from the west, and no longer is there a recollection of those sins, and we've been forgiving of all of it. And, Jesus, and it says that it was nailed to his cross. It wasn't nailed to the cross, it was nailed to Jesus' cross. And that's significant because the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. We talked about how back in that first century time period, that when somebody was forgiven of a debt that they owed, it was posted publicly uh, saying this individual's debt was forgiven. And that's the idea we have here, that Jesus Christ forgave us of all of our sins, uh, completely washed us clean, and publicly declared it, in the declaration, it was posted on the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why skeptics and atheists and naysayers, they hate the cross, because it confronts them with their sin and the accountability. In verse 15, he says this, He have spoiled principalities and powers. Now many times in Scripture, when we read the principalities and powers, we're going to re relate that to the angelic realm. The heavenly beings, angels, things like that. So you remember back in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where Jesus was going to crush the head of the serpent. Remember in Jude, verse number 9, where Satan was arguing, if you will, with Michael the archangel about the body of Moses. Many people believe that Satan wanted the body of Moses because Moses was a murderer. He killed the Egyptian. Remember that in the Exodus prior to. And so what we're seeing here in verse 15 is Satan, the demonic realm, principalities and powers, they don't have power, control over us, over our soul, or anything like that. As a child of God, saved with eternal life, Jesus Christ publicly triumphed, made a show of them openly, and said, if you're a child of God, you are his, and there's nothing they can do about it. And Satan was defeated at that cross that day 2,000 years ago. Going on in verse 16, he says, there, let no man therefore and again, we said it once, we'll say it a thousand times. Anytime you see that word, therefore, you want to ask yourself, what is the therefore? Therefore. And so if we look at that, we look back at what Paul has just written, the Colossians. What's it there for? 
from in verse 8, the circumcision, the eternal life that we receive through Jesus Christ, the fact that we are forgiven all debts, we are saved, we are sanctified, right? Remember, eternal life is present tense. Eternal life isn't something that we're waiting to receive. Jesus Christ said, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It is a present tense thing. Once you come to Christ, you have eternal life from that moment forward. And remember that. So therefore, in verse 16, because we have eternal life, let no one judge you in meat or in drink or respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days. And so I asked you guys, if you guys want to do a little bit of research and studying and everything, uh, did you look into these different areas and maybe have some thoughts on it? What is he talking about? The meat and the drink, the Sabbath days, holy days. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with. Um, yeah, I looked into it a little bit, and, it, and I think it had a lot to do with tradition, or even uh, especially in, in respect to uh, a lot of the Jews. They did have a lot of, um, uh, you know, in the Old Testament in particular, they had a lot of things that they did and. I don't know if you'd call them rituals, but they, there were commandments in the Old Testament, but now that they're under grace and not law, you know, uh, I guess it would be they get judged for not for doing or not doing those things. Right, you'd have the Judaizers, is what they're called, that's really holding to a legalistic aspect of Judaism. And if you remember, back when we're talking about the food or the drink, the meat and the drink, what do you think Paul is talking about here? He says, let no one judge you, therefore, with the food and the drink, the meat and the drink. What do you think he's looking at? The dietary I, laws, right? Right. Yeah, the yeah, Jewish for, dietary laws. Uh, certain uh, certain animals that they weren't allowed to eat. Right. Clean and unclean animals, right? You remember in Acts, uh, the book Acts, where Peter had the vision of the great sheet coming down with all the different types of animals, clean and unclean. And uh, he was told, you know, these are fine to eat now, right? But if you remember, back in Leviticus chapter 11, it talks about this dietary law. And in verse 47, I believe it gives the actual reason why God gave the dietary law. Now, there is the idea of the fact of nutritional value, right? And we've talked about that. But in verse 47 of Leviticus chapter 11, we're told that it is to make a difference between the unclean and the clean between the beasts that may be eaten and the beasts that may not be eaten. I believe, and there's a lot of scholars that believe, that one of the reasons of this dietary law for the Jews was to make an identification between the Jewish people and the Gentile nations around them. To say, we are, we are different. Okay, We are identifying ourselves with God. God told us we shouldn't do these things. And we are not doing these things so that we can be identified with Him. Okay, uh, The Muslims... Uh, really take Judaism, you know, not Judaism, but like the Judaizers, they're very legalistic, and they put a lot of emphasis on maintaining the law to show how righteous and good you are. Muslims are very horribly bad at this because Muslims, a lot of Muslims teach that if they don't make a pilgrimage to Mecca, the Hajj, I think is what it's called, that they can't get into Allah's good favor, possibly get eternal life, go to heaven with Allah, things like that. Plus, with this, the feast, uh, the period of Ramadan, which I think is in the fall time period normally, if they don't fast during that day hours, the daylight hours, they're frowned upon. They're looked upon. Uh, that's going to come into play here in a minute. And so they also have this dietary aspect. But what about the respect of the holy day? What do we know about the Jews in the holy days? What type of holy days did they have? Well, they, I know they had a lot of the feasts. And yep, okay, yep. Definitely. You had a Feast of Unleavened Bread, you had uh, uh, Passover, Feast of First Fruits, Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and uh, all sorts of different things, right? They so said, Let no one judge you when meat or drink, in respect of the holy days, and then the new moon, okay, the new moon. If you want to, you could turn to First Chronicles chapter 23. Or you just trust me as I tell you what it says. First Chronicles chapter 23. You get a small glimpse 
of what happens during what's called the New Moon Feast. Now remember, the Jews, their calendar, their, their timekeeping was based off of a lunar uh, moon phase. And so they had their lunar cycle, and then next month happened when the new moon came and everything. In First Chronicles chapter 23, verse 27, For by the last words of David, the Levites were numbered from 20 years old and above, because their office was to wait on the sons of Aaron for the service of the house of the Lord, in the courts, in the chambers, and in the purifying of all holy things, and the work of the service of the house of God, both for the showbread and for the fine uh, flour for meat offering, and for the unleavened cakes, and that which is baked in the pan, and for that which is fried, and for all manner of measure and size. And to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord, and likewise at even, and to offer all burnt sacrifices unto the Lord in the Sabbaths, in the new moons, and on the set feast by numbers according to the order commanded unto them continually before the Lord. And so the new moon is another feast, if you will, another festival, another holy day that the Jews were required to observe. And basically they would uh, have these sacrifices. It's captured in the Sanhedrin tractate of the Talmud. Okay, If you're not familiar with what a Talmud is, I have uh, a selection of the Talmud. Now this I've picked up at like Books a Million or Barnes and Noble. And basically you have two types, if you will, translations uh, of the Talmud. You have a Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. And uh, many people believe the Babylonian Talmud is actually a little more authoritative than the Jerusalem one. But basically what this is, is this consists of two parts. This consists of the Mishnah and the Gemara. In the Mishnah, remember, the Talmud is solely based upon what's called the Oral Law. So Moses on Mount Sinai received the Ten Commandments and 603 other ones, and God says, you know, thou shalt not murder, right? Thou shalt not steal. But there are other commandments that God had given, like remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, that they weren't exactly sure how to make sure they didn't break that commandment. And so they created what's called the Oral Law. Basically, in the Talmud, they have the Mishnah, where they explain how do we keep some of these laws, these commandments of God, that we're not entirely sure what to do 100% to make sure we don't break them, right? And so you have the Mishnah, which talks about that. Then you have what's called the Gemara. The Gemara is basically rabbinic commentary on what's said on that oral law. For instance, this is one of the tractates for vows, making deals and things like that. The Mishnah right here, it says, The sages declared four vows non-binding, a challenging vow, a nonsense vow, accidental vow, and vows made under duress. Okay, Remember, I believe it was James that said, Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And so in the Old Testament, very similar. So they created this Mishnah aspect of saying, Okay, what deals, what uh, vows are not binding? And they said, okay, these four, challenging, duress, accidental, and nonsense ones, right? And so they explain what is a challenging one, what is a nonsense one. And then you have the Gemara that different rabbis, they debate as far as, okay, this or that, whatever the case is. That's the Talmud. I bring that up because in the Talmud, in Sanhedrin, the tractate Sanhedrin 42a, they have more or less what is prayed the blessing that they would do during the new moon festival. Uh, basically it's called the Burkat HaKodesh. Okay? And what would happen is the last Sabbath of the month, so before the new moon happened and everything, the last Sabbath, the individual, he's called a cantor, C-A-N-T-O-R. He would announce when the first day of the next month the Rosh Kodesh would begin, then he would pray uh, in sort of like a melodious way and everything. In Sanhedrin Tractate, in the 42a, this blessing is read. It says, Praised are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the skies with his word, and all heaven's hosts with the breath of his mouth. He gave them appointed times and roles, and they never missed their cues, doing their creator's bidding with gladness and joy. He is the true creator who acts faithfully, and he has told the moon to renew itself. 
and it goes on from there. So this is a type of blessing, a prayer, a praise, if you will, that they say towards God during this time period. So this was a monthly thing. Once the month was ending, they would announce when the next month was beginning, and they'd go through this. This was a monthly thing. So when he says, uh, let no one judge you in keeping of the new moon, that's what he's talking about. And then finally, the rest, the Sabbath, the rest, and we can see that. These are all religious observances that are part of the Mosaic Law that God had instituted, right, in the Torah. But note that here in this verse, it says, let no man therefore judge you. This word judge in the Greek is krino, K-R-I-N-O. Most often it's used to say judging between right or wrong, okay? You either did something really bad, it's wrong, or really good, it's good, right? But it can be used a few other different ways. And if you were to look in the Greek lexicon, uh, it'll bring the idea that it's not talking about right and wrong in this sense. It's used a little different. It's talking about, ju it's talking about passing judgment on an individual based on their words or deeds. Okay, So this isn't like, hey, you did something completely wrong, period, dot. This is somebody passing judgment on another based on what they're doing or not doing. Okay, For instance... Have you ever heard somebody say, they can't be a Christian because fill in the blank? Mm -hmm. Or you did this, oh, he can't be a Christian, right? You've heard that. We've had a few churches out here. We've heard somebody say, so-and-so believes in abortion. They're not a Christian because a Christian cannot believe in abortion. Unfortunately, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice does not you know, dictate if you're a Christian or not. Okay? Now, I'm pro-life. We're pro-life here and everything else. But... Uh, that doesn't dictate. That's the idea that he's getting. Paul's saying, let no one pass judgment on you on whether you have the Jewish dietary laws, whether you keep the new moons, the feasts, the festivals, or the Sabbath. Like you said earlier, that was the law. We're not under law anymore. We're under grace with Christ. We also know that he's not saying here that we should not judge, period. Because in Matthew 7 and in John chapter 7, Jesus tells us we are to help keep each other, keep Christians accountable, right? Accountability partners. As long as we pull the beam out of our eyes so that we can help them get the beam out of theirs, not be a hypocrite, do it with righteous judgment and things like that. We are supposed to keep people accountable, right? But we're supposed to do it with a heart of compassion and a heart of love. There's a big difference with how the world does it and how we're supposed to do it, right? Because we're supposed to uh, exhort people, encourage people, build them up so that they can be more Christ-like. So, but here when Paul's saying, let no one judge you, he's not saying right or wrong because we remember the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. They talked a little bit about this. He's saying, let no one say that you can't be a Christian or you don't love God because you do this or you do that, okay? That's the idea that, he's believe, that I believe he's getting here, okay? Paul is saying spiritual life is not seen by maintaining the law, the legalism, or the obedience. Remember, this church in the first century that Paul was going through had a few different issues we talked about in the beginning. They had the Gnostics, they had hedonists, they had asceticism, and they had the Judaizers, okay? You get a hint of each of those in this letter. And here I believe he's specifically calling out the Judaizers that's trying to impress the law back onto these people. Same thing we read in the book of Galatians. But moving on in verse 17, it says, These are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now question, okay, the dietary laws. How would you be able to see that as a shadow of, some, of something to come, a shadow of Jesus Christ? Could you sort of see how a dietary law could be that shadow? Like, think of a shadow, right? If you're walking out there in the sun, you see your shadow on the ground, right? That shadow is not you, right? That shadow is just a, a, a resemblance of you. It's a picture of you, right? A silhouette of you. That's what these things are. It's a silhouette. It's a picture of the coming Messiah. As far as the dietary laws, right? What were the dietary laws for according to Leviticus 11.47? It was identification with God. Saying, you Jewish people, you Israelites, you were different from the others. You were my people. I want you to have these laws to go ahead and identify with me. 
And that's the same thing with Jesus Christ. Jesus' purpose, if you were to look in John chapter 1, I think we get this pretty clear. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, to them that believe on his name. So he was coming so that we could be identified with God, that Jesus was the image of God. He was Emmanuel, God incarnate, God in flesh. The same thing with the holy days, the festivals, right? We see how in the Jewish feasts, how Jesus fulfilled certain of those feasts, whether it's the Passover, the Feast of First Fruits, uh, and all the others. We've seen that fulfillment. It was a looking forward of the Messiah. The new moon, with the Sanhedrin tractate, and what the Jews believed as far as this new moon festival, it was the renewing of the month, of the moon. And we can see this as the renewal of man with Jesus Christ. And then with the Sabbath, the Sabbath being a day of rest, right? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come unto me and I will give you rest. So I could see how these four things are clearly a shadow of Jesus Christ. So we could park it and talk a lot more about it. But if you want to do more study, by all means, please do so. So I would just leave this question here and we'll move on. As the law, as these four things were a shadow of of Jesus Christ are we casting a shadow of Jesus Christ in our lives with what we do do people see the love of God the love of Jesus in our works or our actions all these parts of the law pointed to Christ so our words and our actions should also point people to Christ right so if you just take something for the week and think about it, I would encourage you to think about that. So moving on, I just want to go ahead and talk about deception for a minute, right? Have you ever been deceived about something? Have you ever tried to buy a used vehicle or something? I'm sure we've all been deceived by something. Or we watch Chris Angel or one of the magicians with the sleight of hand tricks and everything, right? Well, we, have kids. we have kids. Kids are very deceptive, right? Well, I want to read you something real quick found this on the internet there was a stubborn disputer and he was unconvinced about something Lincoln said let's see how many legs a cow has so how many legs does a cow have four of course came the disgusted apply reply that's right agreed Lincoln now suppose you call the cow's tail a leg how many legs would the cow have five right because you call the cow's tail a leg that's where you're wrong. Just because you call a cow's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. A little bit of trickery, deception, mind games, right? This is important because you'll hear, you'll read, you'll see, especially in the church, so much false teaching going on. We were just talking earlier today about replacement theology, about the church replacing Israel. It's very highly promoted nowadays. Whether you talk about Calvinism, going back to Calvin and Augustine and whoever else, it's very much the common teaching today. But just because the majority of the people believe it's correct doesn't mean it's correct, right? Just because somebody says it doesn't mean it's right. You go over in Africa, Muslim Islam is going to be the predominant majority religion. Does that mean Islam is correct? No, of course not, right? So just because someone says it, just because someone teaches it, doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. So this is what we're getting into in verse 18 when Paul says, Let no man beguile you or deceive you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Okay, So there's a voluntary humility. I had to do some blue letter Bible, lexic theers, lexicon studying to try to figure out what he's really talking about. This voluntary humility is pretentious. It's showy. It's gaudy. It's trying to make yourself look humble for all the wrong reasons. You know, you want to say, look at me, look how humble I am. Or you look at the monks and everything, and they go out there and they live an ascetic lifestyle for the wrong reasons most of the time, right? It's for show. Uh, this aspect of worshiping angels brings the idea of a religious worship. It more about liturgy and everything. This is something that drew me to Catholicism. Okay, I found online 
Because here in verse 18 it says, Let no man, no man beguile you or deceive you in worshiping of angels. Right? Worshiping of angels. So I found online the Catholics teach six reasons, six, why it's biblical to pray to angels. Now let me ask you, would you believe it is biblical to pray to angels? Should we pray to angels? Michael, Gabriel, whoever else is up there. These six reasons they have. Number one, we should pray to angels because your guardian angel is praying for you, according to Matthew chapter 18. Number two, they say angels bring prayers to God. They get this out of their apocryphal book, the book of Tobit. Number three, angels protect us. Number four, people talk to angels. Daniel, Abraham, Apostle John. Number five, the disciples speak to demons. And number six, praying to angels is not consulting with the dead because angels are alive not dead and consulting with the dead is a means to go around God as opposed to go to God right and we saw that with Saul and the witch of Endor so those are six reasons why the Catholics say we should pray to angels right so again you know me I'm very apologetical and everything uh, very much is this right if it's right I want to make sure we do it if it's not right how do we know it's not right? Okay? So number one, your guardian angel is praying for you, so we should pray to them. What would you say? Is that biblical, or should we pray to them? Or if not, why? We can't just say no, right? We have to have a reason. We have to give a defense. So what would you say there? Well, I would think it would be like, uh, you know, if, since we're supposed to follow Jesus' example, we don't see him necessarily making prayer, uh, you know, if we're going to follow a, 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 a prayer template, okay. it would be praying to the Father. You're, uh, you're ahead of me, but yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they reference Matthew chapter 18. Turn there real quick. Matthew chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 10. Verse 10. Who's there? Hi, Ben. <laughs> Holly should be there. Hi, Holly. Hi, everybody else. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Gabe, Whitney. 18, verse 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Right? Right. So that's the verse that they say our guardian angel is praying for you. But... I would just say right there, I don't see anything about that, about the guardian angel actually praying. It's just saying that the angel is in the presence of God. Okay, that's what my scripture says. Uh, but besides the point, let's move on to number two. Angels bring prayers to God. They use the book of Revelation and the altar of incense, which are the prayers going up, but they mainly focus on the book of Tobit, uh, which is an apocryphal book. Okay, So they say the book of Tobit, teaches that we should pray to God because angels bring our prayers to him. Tobit chapter 4 verse 11. It says that alms, doing good things, uh, giving money, things like that, alms deliver from all sin and death and will not suffer, permit, allow the soul to go into darkness. Tobit chapter 12 verse 9 says alms delivers from death and the same is that which is which purges away sins and makes to find mercy and life everlasting. So in two verses in the book of Tobit, and I've looked at it in its context in chapter 4 and chapter 12, I even talked to a friend of mine who got out of the Catholic Church uh, about this. In the book of Tobit and other books in the Apocrypha teach that doing good works pays uh, for your sins. Okay, as part of the penance. This alms, the alms giving and thing is like that, it's called internal penance, okay? So I talked to my buddy. He would say we would have to go to confession, uh, talk to the priest there. The priest would go to God, and from there, uh, the priest would tell the individual what they would have to do to get forgiven of that sin. And so this is part of the forgiveness of the sin. As opposed to chapter Colossians 2, verse 14, that Jesus 
blotted out the ordinances that was against us. He obliterated it, completely wiped it away because of Jesus Christ. So that's another reason why if, if you have one thing incorrect, very much wrong in Scripture, you got to toss out the whole book because now you got to pick and choose what do you think is right and wrong, right? Mm -hmm. You go down that slippery slope. If you can ever find something wrong in Scripture, we got to throw Scripture out because it can't have anything wrong. It's inerrant. It's infallible. The Book of Tobit is very fallible. The Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price that I have over there, very fallible. The Christian Science Book by Mary Lee, uh, Marietta E. Baker, Baker, very fallible, right? So you got to throw those out. Jesus is truth. And so the Book of Tobit can get dismissed. Number three. They said angels protect us, right? The third reason is because angels protect us. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Angels are ministering spirits, right? But let me ask you this. Do police protect us? Do military protect us? Why don't we pray to them, right? Let's just keep going down that road. Number four. People talk to angels, so we should pray to angels, right? Eve talked to a snake. Balaam talked to a donkey. Should we pray to donkeys and snakes as well? Where does it stop? Disciples spoke to demons. So we should pray to demons, right? Because this is the rationale. Number six. Consulting with the dead is demonic and is an attempt to reach deceased people. Remember, Saul, when he went to the witch of Endor, he was trying to summon up, I believe it was Samuel, uh, because Samuel had passed on. God already judged Saul and God wasn't speaking to Saul, and the prophet wasn't speaking to Saul. So Saul went to see the witch of Endor, who was a medium, who was supposed to get a, a, uh, a lying spirit, a demon, a fallen angel, to pretend to be, you know, Samuel, whatever the case is. And God allowed Samuel to show up that one time, right? I think it's 1 Samuel, maybe 2 Samuel, chapter 23, I think it is. Interesting story. And so consulting with the dead is very demonic in his attempt to reach deceased people as opposed to what they're saying as well. So, if we're going to say no to these six reasons why we shouldn't pray to angels according to why they're wrong in their six reasons, we have to have a reason, right? So those would be my refutation of those six reasons. Now, there are two reasons why we don't pray to angels. Matt, you hit the nail on the head on one of them. What were you saying again? So that we would follow the template or the example that Jesus gave us. Exactly. Matthew chapter 6, right? Our Father, with heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? He gave us that template. Anytime you see Jesus praying, he's praying, Father, 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 right? He's never praying to an angel. Number two is in Hebrews chapter 4. Jesus is our high priest. We need no other mediator to get to God but Jesus Christ, right? And so he is the one, if anybody takes prayers from us to God, Jesus is that high priest, is that mediator, according to Hebrews chapter 4. We need not pray to angels. We should not pray to angels. Even if you look in the book of Revelation and other times in the Old Testament where a believer would come face to face to an angel and they would fall down at their, uh, on their knees, an angel said, no, don't do that. Don't worship me, for I'm just a servant, a messenger, you know. Same thing. So, there you go. Moving on. Verse 19, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have a nourishment ministered and knit together increase with the knowledge of God. So here we go. He says, let no one deceive you, beguile you of your reward and worshiping of angels, false humility, not holding the head. So what's the purpose of the head? from which all the body by joints and bands have a nourishment ministered and knit together increase with knowledge of God. Just as our head gives our body from the brain, you know, the signals, the impulse, things to do, on what to do and things like that, Jesus, our head, gives us the function and the dependence rather than the false teaching and the deception that's going on here. You want to know one way to... to prevent yourself from being deceived by sleight of hand or, or just persuasive words like we talked about a couple weeks back is by holding the head okay and this is in present tense in verse 19 holding the head it needs to be a continual thing a day by day a moment by moment right we don't do it perfectly 
Peter didn't do it perfectly if you read about him, you know, when Paul had to confront him to the face uh, in, in public. But our focus should be on continually being with Jesus, continually thinking of Jesus, continually not asking what would Jesus do, but asking what did Jesus do, right? Because we know he did and he was tempted all the ways we were except without sin. We know that he went through most everything that we go through, right, just without that sin. And so if we maintain this dependence upon God, we should be able to prevent ourselves from being de deceived by all the false teaching, the deception that Satan and the adversary is throwing at us, okay? Almost done, verse 23, or verse 20 through 23. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why? As though living in the world are you subject to ordinances. Remember, the parentheses, that's more of a parenthetical statement, okay? I'm going to read these verses, removing the parentheses, and you see it flows together perfect. The parentheses is just sort of a, a parenthetical statement, just something else to add to it. It says, why, if you're a dead Christ from the rudiments of the world, why? As though living in the world are you subject to ordinances, after the commandments and doctrines of men, right? So here he's focusing on the Judaizers, right? He's focusing on the legalistic aspect that these believers that they were being confronted with, with the Jews trying to bring in the law still when they're under grace. But he says here, if you are dead with Christ, we are dead with Christ, right? We already talked about this in chapter 3. He says that, we are dead and our life is hid with Christ and God. Okay? So we are dead, number one, to sin, and number two, to the law. Romans chapter 6, verse 2, we're dead to sin. Romans chapter 7, verse 4, we are dead to the law. Okay? Think about a zombie, right? Think about a zombie for a minute. Zombies, they're not influenced by the world, right? They're not influenced by what's going on around them, right? They just want one thing. They want brains, right? They just want to just take care of people, right? Think of that. In a similar fashion, we are dead with Christ, okay? We are dead with Christ, dead to the law and dead to sin. We are told that by Paul in Romans. It should have no power over us. Should. Should have no power over us. We are not compelled by sin or the law. We're not compelled by the flesh. But we are impelled, okay? We, we are focused on it. Sometimes we just give in because we still have that nature. We still have the flesh and the spirit that war with each other, right? And so though we are dead to the sin, dead to the law, we still have that flesh, flesh nature over us. So remember that, that we are dead with Christ. We are dead, it says, from the rudiments of the world. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. But first... I want to talk about John chapter 17, verse 16, because this plays a role too. When we're talking about being dead to the world and dead to the sin, what did Jesus have to say in his high priestly prayer? In chapter 17, verse 14 through 16, Jesus says, I have given them thy word, and the world hateth them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Right? Jesus constantly says that Jesus is not of the world, and we as believers are not of the world. Right? He says he doesn't want to take us out of the world, so we are in the world. Right? So let me ask you, what's the difference of being in something and being of something? Have you ever thought about that? Those two letters are very pivotal in understanding. Let me give you an example. This right here, if you've never seen it before, this is called a mezuzah. Okay, a mezuzah. Basically, this is from the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. In these words I command you this day, you shall uh, teach him when you walk by, rise up, sit down. You'll put him as frontless between your eyes and on the doorposts of your house, okay? Uh, the, the Hebrew word for doorpost is mezuzah, okay? So what the Jews would do is they would take this 
And inside of this is a scroll, okay? A scroll. It has Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 11 written on it, right? Because the Jews are very literal with things. And so they literally take the words that God commanded them in the Shema, and they take this and they put it on the corner post of their door, okay? Door post. So I bring this up to illustrate. This parchment right here, this is in the mezuzah, right? It's actually inside of it, right? But it's not of the mezuzah. It is not made of the mezuzah. The mezuzah is a different type of material, some sort of metal, whatever the case is. It's made of parchment. It's made of paper, right? To be in something, you're surrounded by something, okay? To be of something, you have a relationship with it, right? This parchment is in the mezuzah. It is not made of the mezuzah. It is not a part of the mezuzah, right? It does not have that relationship, if you will. In a similar fashion, we are in the world. There's no denying that, right? We live in this secular society. But we should not be of the world. We should not have the relationship with this world. I was reading a book that I had, uh, uh, Godly Principles, uh, Principles for a Godly Man, I think it was, written in like the 80s. Those books seem to be the best written books. Nowadays, I just, I just think the older books are just written better. But in there, he talks about David's sin with Bathsheba. Okay, Bathsheba. It was very interesting because when you look at that progression of his sin with Bathsheba, I think I took a picture of it so I can read it. Did you know that during that one incident that David broke all ten commandments? Did you realize that? Did you ever consider that? Listen to this. David broke the tenth commandment of coveting his neighbor's wife, which led him to commit adultery, breaking the seventh commandment. In order to steal his neighbor's wife, breaking the eighth, he committed murder and broke the sixth. He broke the ninth commandment by bearing false witness against his brother. This all brought dishonor to his parents, breaking the fifth commandment. In this way, he broke all ten commandments that relating to loving one's neighbor as, I sell, uh, as oneself, and in doing so, he dishonored God, breaking the first four commandments. Now, have you ever thought about that? I thought that was very interesting. In reading that book, and reading this guy's uh, insight into that, he has a few different reasons why he believes David fell into that sin of adultery. One of them was called desensitization. That it was culturally acceptable to have more than one wife. It was culturally acceptable to take something that was not yours, right? And so he saw that was just the norm of the culture in that day, right? The influence around him. It desensitized it himself. And that sort of started that slippery slope, right? And in today, we can sort of see that with Hollywood. We can see it with music, things like that. You know, I encourage, if you've never heard of it, get a program called VidAngel, V-I-D-A-N-G-E-L. And it filters out a lot of nonsense that you don't need to see. But if you look at the progression of Hollywood, and you look at Satanism, the occult that's in it, you definitely see, whether it's the murdering, whether it's the sex, whether it's the words, whether it's the anti-Semitism, whether it's the anti-God, anti-Christ, the more we watch that stuff, the more we're getting desensitized to it, you know? And so we are very uh, much able to fall into the same trap as David did, thereby breaking all the same commandments as well, maybe not to that same extent or as egregious, but just consider that. We are not of the world. We should be different. Just like the dietary laws the Jews had, we should have something that says, you know what? They're different. They're not getting drunk. They're not doing drugs. They're not ha cheating on their spouse. There's something different. What is different about them? We should be able to show them that it's Jesus Christ in us that is different between the world and them. We're not going to get out of the world. We're going to be in the world until we die. But we don't have to be of the world. Remember in verse 11, we were told that we were circumcised by Jesus. Circumcision is the cutting off, the removal 
we were circumcised. Jesus cut off the world from us, the flesh, the sins, the adversary. The adversary no longer has any power over us. Our sins no longer have any power over us. Jesus triumphed and made a show of them openly. Verse 12, we were baptized with Jesus, allowed us to die from the world to live with Christ. Remember in chapter 1, we were told by Paul that we were, uh, tran we were removed from the power of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his dear son. The power of darkness is that Greek word talking about authority. When you got saved... You were taken away from the authority of darkness, of sin, of wickedness. You no longer had to be in bondage and enslavement of that. You were transferred into the authority of Jesus Christ's kingdom to live in power, in life, and things like that. We should not live according to the world and its customs. Okay? So, just moving on from that, we're almost done. I want to talk about this rudiments world, word thing, right? talked about this before there's a few varying thoughts on what does it mean of rudiments okay remember Gnosticism was very much uh, influencing this church back then the rudiments basically meaning the elementary principles the ABC's your foundational teachings or tenets uh, some people believe these were the the Judaizers, the legalistic rules and rituals and commandments, uh, the outward appearance, the external, if you will. Warren Wiersbe sees this as the Gnostic tenets, the foundational beliefs of Gnosticism, right? Uh, you are removed uh, from the rudiments of the world, the Gnostic teachings that's influencing a lot. Remember, Colossae was similar to Corinth in the fact that it received uh, a lot of philosophical ideas. A lot of different varying thoughts and everything. Remember, Gnosticism, they taught prim primal fire, Eon, Sophia, uh, Jehovah that created this world. They, they teach that the universe is made up of one being, and out of this one being, all these other eons, or spirit beings, if you will, came about, emanated from this one, called primordial, primordial fire. And from the Sophia, wisdom, the Greek word for wisdom, created other beings and then the world was created by a being called Jehovah they taught all this but they also taught asceticism strict obedience uh, to many different laws and rules because they wanted to attain salvation okay they were taught that there was salvation to be had but it's not salvation in the sense of we did things wrong and we need to be saved they taught very similar to the Mormons that they're ignorant of their original state. They're igno ignorant of creation and the real God and everything else. In that sort of like Near Eastern uh, religions, they were trying to have self-enlightenment, trying to find the secret knowledge, right? And part of it was able to be found by strict obedience to rules and commandments. And that's one of the things. Mormons teach something called pre-existence. They teach that before everybody was born, we pre-existed with God up in heaven. In that... We don't remember our life up there because God had veiled us uh, when we were born here. We don't remember that. So it's similar belief. But however you want to slice this, if we're dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, whether it's man's traditions, religiosity, secularism, and culture, or if Paul's referring to the historical threat of Gnosticism and the strict ascetic belief, Paul reveals that both of these are coming from man's inventions and man's teachings rather than God. It's very important that we realize who are we listening to. Are we listening to God or are we listening to man? How do we know it's from God? Number one, it'll be in this book. Number two, it'll be accurately interpreted. Number three, it won't contradict other teachings and sayings and tenets and beliefs held in this elsewhere. Finally, uh, again in verse 23 it says, these things have a show of wisdom Okay, so they appear to uh, provide benefit, right? They appear to be good. But he says, not in any honor of the satisfying of flesh. They appear to be good and have benefit, but it doesn't satisfy the desire of the flesh. Okay? Like the Muslims. You can have all these strict rules. You can have all these laws and regulations. It's not going to keep, you know, some of them from following their honest tenants of kill all the Jews and all the polytheists where you find them, right? It's not going to keep them from that. Just like in America, in other countries, 
You can have all the rules in the world. It's not going to change the heart. The way that we change the issues in society today is not legislation, but it's with God and with the Holy Spirit in a changed heart. Not being conformed to Christ, but being transformed by the Spirit. In 2016, there were 300,000 robberies. There are an average of 321,000 sexual assaults every year. In 2016, there was 17,000 murders. Laws and legalism don't keep people from doing evil. It will never satisfy the flesh. Only Jesus Christ is able to give that victory through the Holy Spirit. Just to enclose right here in this chapter, if we're going to be following obedience, please make sure we're following obedience, not because what man says and the rules that are in place, but we're following obedience because we want to do it out of the devotion, out of a love for Jesus and what he's done. Obedience has to come from the inside out. Okay, It has to be born of the Spirit. One of the issues we had out here with the churches that we were trying to find is I asked them, We've been there about four or five months. Haven't heard the gospel preached one time. Even on Easter, we went back and looked at their Christmas service. No gospel. Jesus is the reason for, obviously, the season. But every day, Paul says, without the crucifixion, without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Christ, our faith is in vain and we're still in our sins. How on the one day a year you don't preach a resurrection when that is the crux to Christianity? If you can... If you can refute the, uh, the resurrection, you could destroy Christianity. But you can't, and they've tried, and it will never happen. So I ask, why doesn't the gospel get preached there? One of the reasons they said, it's because people just get tired of hearing about it. And that's the issue. When we ever quit thinking about the price that Jesus Christ paid for your soul and my soul, we have a sick problem and we start living of the world, becoming of the world and not in the world. What Jesus did for you and for me 2,000 years ago, stretched on the cross with three nails, a crown of thorns, and a spear to his thigh, side, you wouldn't do it for your enemy, but Jesus Christ did that when you hated him. That's why we need to be do, doing living in obedience, not because of man's traditions and man's rules, but because of what Jesus Christ did for us. I made a note here in Colossians, and with this, um, I'll be done. If Jesus Christ did so much for you, how can we do so little for him? Right? I'm just going to leave you with that parting thought and everything. We'll close in a word of prayer. And I thank you for being, being here tonight. Uh, next week, what is next week? The 15th. Uh, we'll be here, but the following week, you know, I, I won't be available. So, any comments, critiques, concerns before I close in prayer? Oh, just got